Okay. So let's continue. I think we're going to continue until 5 uh, with this. Uh, and if you have questions after that, feel free to catch me here. I'll be around. Or you can catch me tomorrow also. Uh, so we're going to switch gears to this other question. We've actually changed a lot in the system, in some cases more than the others. Uh, especially with Tesseract, we changed a lot in the system. Uh, but now we're going to look at the minimal approaches. What is the minimal processing in memory support we can provide to exploit 3D stacked memory? And the idea uh, is simple. Basically, we don't want to change anything in the system. How can you still take advantage? Well, not anything in the system. Any big thing in the system, how do you still take advantage of processing in memory? We want to get the most out of near data processing with minimal cost, minimal change to the system, no changes to the programming model. Programming model is sequential, right? And there are two key ideas over here in this work. Uh, the idea is very simple. We expose each PIM operation as a cache coherent, virtually addressed host processor instruction called PIM enabled instructions that operates only on a single cache block. For example, if you want to do uh, an addition uh, of the rank and the value, you convert it to a PIM add primitive in your language, and that gets translated into this PIM add instruction or PEI add instruction. Now, the advantages are no changes to the sequential execution programming model. This is an instruction just like any other in the instruction stream. And the processor can decide to execute it internally or it can ship it to memory. Uh, there are no changes to the virtual memory because, again, it's an instruction that needs to get translated in the processor before it gets shipped to memory. There are minimal changes to cache coherence because the granularity of the operation of the instruction is only a single cache block. And that's the granularity of coherence in existing systems. And there's no need for data mapping also. Each PIM enabled instruction is restricted to a single memory module because it doesn't span beyond the cache block. So this single cache block restriction enables a lot of benefits. Of course, it gets rid of some of the benefits of processing in memory. Now you can do bulk bitwise operations like what we've discussed earlier. So the second key idea in this work is orthogonal, which is we want to dynamically decide where to execute this PIM enabled instruction. Uh, do you want to do it in the processor or do you want to do it in the processing in memory accelerator based on simple locality characteristics and simple predictors? And we're going to talk ab about this very briefly. So wherever their, your data resides, you would like to execute this. In this case, it's a, we have a predictor, hardware predictor. Yeah, but it's, it's not yeah. the programmer. It's not the programmer. No, no, it's not. Yeah, this is dynamic, basically. Yeah, it's not the program. It's really, uh, we look at the locality of the data that this is touching. If it's in the memory, we execute it in memory. OK, so basically, uh, Simple PIM operations as ISA extensions, you can think of it that way. You have the same graph processing workload that we looked at before, page rank. Uh, if you look at this, what happens is you need to bring the rank, uh, you need to operate on it in the processor, and you need to write the result back. So you get 64 bytes in and 64 bytes out. If you actually convert this to a PIM add instruction, which gets translated, uh, this is the uh, mnemonic, if you will, that you use in the uh, uh, programming language, but it gets translated into this PIM add instruction. You basically may decide to ship the value over there and do the computation. Now you have eight bytes in and zero bytes out of main memory. Right? So you save a lot actually. As opposed to moving 128 bytes, now you're moving only eight bytes. So the savings are still high. Uh, okay, so that's the idea basically. So, uh, okay, I don't know what's happening. This, this is the problem with HDMI as you can see. <laughs> so we've also done the study. Uh, is it always a good idea to execute in memory? That's not a good idea. Uh, basically, these are the workloads that we've examined, and these are graphs with more vertices as you go to the right. And there are cases, if you always execute in memory, you lose in these cases because your cache actually provides you a very good locality and high bandwidth. In this case, your cache is not sufficient, so you gain. So basically, you reduce the memory bandwidth consumption due to in-memory computation over here. But here, uh, you increase the memory bandwidth consumption because caching is very effective for these smaller, relatively smaller uh, graphs. OK, so the idea of PIM enabled instruction is very simple. Uh, and the, we add this fence over here so that it ensures that the, all of the previous instructions uh, that are sent to memory are complete before you move on. So what are these instructions? These are some examples. Actually, if you have configurable logic uh, in the logic layer, these instructions are relatively easy to implement, I think. Of course, you need to change the processor to support them also. But one example is 8-byte integer increments. 8-byte uh, integer min, you find the minimum of integers. 
uh, floating point ads, hash table probing, consistogram bin index, Euclidean distance computation, especially in stream cluster, uh, stream based clustering. Uh, that's very useful. Dot products and support vector machines. So different applications require, based on our analysis, require different types of instructions. So it's good to have flexible logic layer that can implement this. And of course, this is not a comprehensive set, right? If you come up with some other application that uh, can benefit, you can put it over there. And these are executed either in the memory or in the processor. It's a dynamic decision. There's low cost locality monitoring for a single instruction. And these are cache coherent, virtually addressed, single cache block only, as we said. And yeah, it's atomic between different PIM enabled instructions, but it's not atomic with normal instructions. So you use PFANS for the ordering. Because you ship it to memory, you need to have some ordering at some point, right? So the key to practicality is this restriction, single cache block restriction. Each PIM enabled instruction can access at most one last double cache block. Similar restrictions exist actually in existing atomic instructions. So this localizes each PIM enabled instruction to one memory module. If, you do, if you're doing cache block interleaving, this still works nicely. As we discussed earlier, even row clone requires something else other than cache block interleaving. Uh, inter, uh, basically, you have easier support for cache coherence and virtual memory, especially for cache coherence because the granularity of that is cache block today. Uh, simplified locality monitoring. Basically, you uh, monitor the locality of a single cache block, and you can identify this in the cache also without a lot of extra logic. And this is the example uh, PIM enabled instruction microarchitecture, just, uh, just for your visualization. Uh, we basically uh, have uh, a PEI management unit over here and PEI computation unit. The host processor, based on this locality monitor, it decides whether to execute in the computation unit or send it to the computation unit that's inside the 3D stack memory. Of course, the computation unit can be inside the out-of-order core, no question about that. And also, if you want to actually exe uh, execute inside memory, you lock it inside memory using this PIM directory such that nobody else accesses it and brings it into the cache. So what we've done is we've evaluated these instructions that I showed you earlier on 10 data intensive workloads. Some of them are graph processing workloads that we used earlier. Uh, some of them are machine learning and data mining like SVM. And we looked at three different input sets because input set size matters quite a bit. And yeah, this is the summary of the results. You get about 47% average speed up with large input data sets, and 32% speed up with small input data sets, and 25% energy reduction with a single node with large input data sets. So we're going to look at these results a little bit more. So these are the workloads that we looked at, graph processing, data analytics, and machine learning, and data mining. Let's look at the data set size uh, and its effect. So these are the large inputs. Uh, the baseline is executing everything in the processor, no processing in memory. And the y-axis is the performance delta. Uh, and uh, this is, if you, if you ship all of these PIM-enabled instructions into uh, the uh, processing in memory engine, so you get benefit. But you do better if you actually have this locality-aware mechanism that decides whether or not to ship. Slightly better. So on average, this is geometric mean, you get about 47% performance improvement. This is large input sets. So maybe locality monitoring doesn't matter in this case as much. Uh, and the benefits, you're actually gaining benefits by reducing the amount of transfer. Uh, so if you look at small input sets, uh, it's a different kind of story. Uh, this is, uh, baseline is again CPU only, and this is the performance improvement you get compared to CPU only. If you, if you ship all of the PIM enabled instructions into main memory, then you lose performance in pretty much all of them except for this one. Uh, but if you actually decide whether or not to ship to main memory, uh, then you actually curb those performance losses. And on average, you gain very little. But these are small input set, set, data sets. Most of them fit in the cache except for this one. And as you can see, if you actually ship things to memory with small input data sets, you actually increase the amount of, of chip transfer, which is not a good idea. That's why having a dynamic decision helps. And these are the medium inputs that are somewhat, somewhere in between, as you can see over here. Basically, this is uh, PIM only. If you ship everything to a processing in memory, you gain a little bit. In some cases, you gain a lot. But if you actually have a dynamic decision, you gain a lot in some of these cases uh, because sometimes you, you really need to be aware of where your data is uh, in order to decide whether or not to ship. So hopefully, these are some interesting results. And this is the energy consumption. Again, small input data sets, you don't gain much energy, even with being locality aware. If you ship everything to memory, you lose energy, actually. With medium input data sets, you gain a little bit more energy. 
And with large input data sets, that's where you actually benefit most in terms of energy reduction. This is a, the entire system energy reduction for a single node. And there's a breakdown also that you can look at in the paper. So that's the idea of twin enabled instruction. I think this is relatively practical. It's a simple and low cost approach to processing in memory. There are no changes to the programming model, no changes to virtual memory. Uh, you don't get rid of virtual memory also. Uh, you dynamically decide where to execute an instruction. The disadvantage, of course, is your benefits is not as high, right? You get about 40, 50 percent as opposed to uh, 2x or 13x. And that's the, the biggest limitation is the single cache block restriction. And I think there's more work to be done in this area. Any questions? Make sense? Okay. Maybe. <laughs> some people are nodding, some people are. Yeah, that's the. So if you, let's say if you, hypothetically, if you say that you change the command for full page somehow, uh -huh. that will not change the, the story. Full page meaning? Uh, like full, <laughs> full OS page, like phone page. Okay. Let's say it's one OS. Four, uh, I just wonder if there is an overhead of sending, uh, sending the. What's command. The overhead of sending the instruction? Oh, I see. Put I see. Mm -hmm. every Every instruction. Every, I see. Every, I see. Every, every text line. Yeah, it will be yeah. Yeah. I think. I think there is some overhead. We didn't study that overhead, but certainly, if you if you can do more with a single instruction, you save that instruction bandwidth also, right? Yeah. But how, how, how important is it? I don't know. Actually, I don't know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It may be less, but it's the benefit is really coming from the data moment savings, because you're doing the same thing in the processor that you would do over here. There's nothing special that we're doing. And also, I guess we're, uh, yeah, we're doing the same thing on the processor, actually. Even if it's a customized instruction, we have the same instruction inside the processor. Euclidean distance, for example, we add it to the processor also so that you can, you can execute it anywhere. But yeah, if you have a larger granularity, I think you would save a, a little bit more. But I don't know the quantification. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So this is, I think, interesting. There is more uh, to be done. And we've actually, actually looked at, uh, in this paper, we, basically we want to be as transparent as possible. In this paper, uh, we developed a compiler-based mechanism that decides what warps to upload to, uh, to a GPU that's close to memory. And again, this is also programmer transparent. And as a result, performance benefits are not really very high. We get about 30 to 40% performance benefit, for example, in this case. So whenever you're transparent, whenever you're not really changing a lot in the system, your performance benefits are going to go down. I don't, I don't have any doubt. That's true for this also, basically. Uh, and we've been looking at uh, prefetching also, like right, doing run ahead inside the memory controller in addition to computation. And the benefits are similar. Okay, coherence is another issue. I don't know if I want to tackle this uh, because this also opens up a can of worms. So if you actually want to be really efficient in terms of coherence, you need to do something different. And maybe we'll get to that when we talk about uh, the adoption issues. Before I go into the adoption issues, let me uh, put these big slides. Basically, we want fundamentally energy efficient architectures. And I think that requires us to be more data centric. And if you want to be fundamentally low latency, that's also data centric. So this is where energy efficiency and low latency come together. And we, want to, we don't want to move data. So let's move to the adoption issues because there's a lot. And I think the, the last part that we covered goes into the adoption issues also. How do you enable uh, uh, processing in memory with minimal changes? But there is more in terms of adoption. It's not only minimal changes, but you need to have applications, as somebody pointed out early, er, uh, early on, and you need to have functionality. You need to make it easy to program. You need to have the interfaces. You need to have the compiler and the hardware support. You need to have the system support, coherence and virtual memory. We talked about virtual memory. Uh, coherence is important. How do you enable that? I'll very briefly talk about that. And you need to have runtime systems for adaptive scheduling. This PIM enable instructions has a very simple runtime system. But if you actually do larger scale processing in memory, you need to have something even stronger, I think, 
and data mapping and access and sharing control. Because if you have an accelerator on the memory side, how do you share that now? How do you do the access control? And also, you need to develop infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility. So there's a lot over here. So basically, I think we need to revisit the entire stack to be able to do this. But one, let's, let's look at some of these challenges in some detail. Maybe not a lot of detail. But one key challenge is code mapping. Which operations should be executed inside the memory versus the CPU? This is an example in, the, in, in case of GPU. So who decides that? Uh, you can punt it to the programmer. And actually, we've done a lot of what we've done is programmer-based, as you can see. This is compiler-based, this work uh, that's depicted over here. But who does that is an interesting question for sure. Uh, so in the Google workloads, for example, we went through every single workload and decided what to offload and what not to offload. That's one example, but that requires a lot of programmer effort for sure. And I think the programmers who want to take advantage of it will do it, no question. Once, once the hardware is there, programmers will do it. But maybe not all of the programmers will do it. So the second challenge is how should data be mapped across different 3D memory stacks? Because if you want to actually uh, execute in memory, the data may be in memory, like A may be here, B may be here, and C may be here, and you want to add A, B, and store the results in C, doesn't sound good, right? So you're back to square one. So this data mapping is really important. Uh, and this is not an easy problem. This paper developed some solutions, but it's very specific to the applications that are executing over there. I'm not sure if there's a general solution. So data mapping in general is a very hard problem. That's why I discussed it very early in the fundamentals uh, part. OK. OK, let's talk about coherence a little bit. Uh, I think this is also a very hairy problem. Uh, so these are some workloads that we've examined, very similarly to the Google workloads case. Uh, Amir Ali, actually, my student who did the study in Google workloads, he did these studies before. He basically went through some of these workloads, like graph computation and in-memory databases, uh, hybrid transactional analytical processing. And he basically looked at what functions should be offloaded to 3D stack memory. And he did a lot of partitioning mechanisms, and he figured out what should be offloaded. And he partitioned code between CPU and the uh, PIM engine. And we wanted to keep things coherent. Uh, so if you execute CPU only, this is the black bars is what you would get. That's the normalized. Ideal PIM, there is no coherence overhead with the partitioning that he has developed. So ideal PIM actually, geometric mean you get about 50% performance improvement. Not bad, because you do function level offloading, you don't actually change a whole lot in the system, except you need to handle coherence somehow because you cannot assume ideal. So these are the traditional coherence mechanism, fine-grained coherence, like the MESI protocol of today, coarse-grained coherence. Uh, basically, you do it on a more region basis. Uh, and non-cacheable, non which basically you basically say, the parts that are going to be touched by PIM, you're not going to cache it in the processor. These are three different approaches to coherence that you could employ today. And none of them is good if you look at it. So fine-grained coherence, on average, buys you maybe 10% over here. If you do coarse-grained coherence, coarse-grained meaning basically, whenever before you start operating on the data, you flush the data into the PIM. And then PIM operates on the data, and then uh, you don't allow access uh, from the CPU to that data. It's a, it's a very coarse-grained, so you lose some performance compared to the baseline, which is not good. Whereas ideal PIM is actually gaining performance if there is no coherence overhead. And non-cacheable is actually not good at all because basically you're not taking advantage of the CPU caches in that case for data that's going to be touched by PIM. You're, going to mark, you're marking those regions. So non-cacheable actually loses significant performance, like 20% over here. So none of the existing coherence mechanisms work. Fine-grained coherence works a little bit. It provides you performance improvement, but basically in this case, whenever the PIM is touching some data, it needs to actually get permissions to that data. You, you communicate back to the CPU. So it makes no sense. So there needs to be more work in this area. The proposal in this paper, which I'm not going to go into the details of, is essentially a semi-transactional mechanism. Uh, the PIM engine operates on the data, assuming that it has permissions. And it basically keeps track of what it has read and what it has written. And before actually committing its results, uh, CPU also has uh, uh, a list of what it has read and what it has written. And before actually you commit the results of the PIM engine, you check whether there is a conflict in the 
in, in, in what the CPU has read and written and in what the PIM engine has read and written. And if there's a data conflict, then you basically roll back the PIM engine. So it's very similar to the basic transactional execution principles, except in this case, we rolled back only the PIM engine. CPU is uh, assumed to have priority. Uh, this way, you don't need to change the existing CPUs, but you can uh, employ the PIM engines in the field. And that actually buys you significant benefit. It's still not as close to the ideal PIM, but it's closer than any of the existing mechanisms, as you can see. It buys you about, I think, 30% 30, 30 or so, maybe. That's the idea. But this requires now more complexity in the system. Basically, you need to have this PIM engine as part of the transactional execution environment. And there's a lot of analysis in the paper that shows the overhead of this. But it's better than existing coherence mechanisms. So I think there's more need for uh, developing simpler coherence mechanisms that can achieve uh, the, higher, uh, the higher benefits, the ideal PIM benefits over here. Any questions? I covered a lot in one slide over here. Yes? So the coherence issue is, yes, you tell the PIM to do something for you, but there may be some other thread that's executing on the shared data. So the problem comes because of the shared data structures. Exactly. So exactly. So we're not dealing with the consistency. So there, I think there's a whole other issue, like consistency. What's the semantics that you want? But we're not tackling that even over here. We're just tackling the coherence part. So you're right, I think. There needs to be maybe consistency models related to this also. Maybe, yes, exactly. Like what's, but I think tra maybe transactional execution can help that also. Question? OK. OK. Uh, so let's go to the next one. So if you're interested, there is a paper related to this. And I already said this over here. So there's more to do in this area. We've been looking at concurrent data structures. This is actually really interesting, I think, because uh, you need actually to customize your data structures for near memory computing. Because if you have concurrent data structures in the processor, and if you actually don't have concurrent data structures in main memory, then you have a problem, right? Because you're using the parallel processing capability in the CPUs, but inside the memory, you're serializing everything. That's not a good idea. And this paper tackles that issue. I'm not going to go over that. But there is more to do in that area also. And clearly, we need simulation infrastructures also. And we've been extending Ramulator for PIM. Some of it is available. Some of it is not available. And there's more to do in this area. And we've actually more recently been looking at using FPGA-based infrastructures to emulate at least some of the benefits of PIM. Although this is not easy, because FPGAs are also fundamentally bottlenecked by the DRAM access latency and bandwidth, right? And I think applications, there's a lot more to do also. I'll cover this very briefly. Uh, we talked about uh, filtering uh, in, in uh, DNA read mapping. I'm going to cover this briefly and show you some benefits. Uh, you may not understand everything over here, but that's OK. And that's why we've been looking at studies like this. There's more to do in the application space, uh, I think. But let me cover this relatively quickly with one slide and maybe a couple of uh, example, uh, a couple of uh, auxiliary slides. And we were discussed this, genome read mapping is important. Uh, it's an approximate string matching problem, uh, and we've we already discussed that also. And alignment is very expensive. So basically, this work looks at uh, an in-memory processing algorithm. It's called Grim filter. Maybe that's not a great name. <laughs> uh, actually, the same, the same students who developed Grim filter, they also did the Reaper. So now you have Grim Reaper. Reaper. Uh, that's a joke, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, it's an in-memory processing algorithm for exciting read mapping, and it uh, tries to reduce the uh, number of required alignments. And the speed-ups that we get are about 3.7x, which is not bad. Uh, 
And I, I'm going to show you what is required over here. Basically, it's a lot of bitwise operations. You need to customize your algorithm to the layout of the bank. And if this was a longer, uh, if I wanted to spend more time on it, I would tell you the full thing. But basically, uh, you, you have these bit vectors for different bins in the genome. And you basically lay them out in a bank. And now you can process many of the uh, bins in the genome in parallel to see if you have a match or not match. And uh, the logic is very simple, as you can see. We have a compa competitor, accumulator, and then incrementer. It's very simple. And with, uh, that's what's needed in the logic layer. And you need to have the data layout uh, uh, done nicely. For example, uh, the way we do this is you want to search for tokens and whether some tokens exist in some parts of the genome. And these are the bit vectors that are corresponding to different parts of the genome, uh, like bin zero over here, whether this token five A's exists in this part, in this part, in this part, in this part. And you have a bunch of tokens, as you can see. And whenever you do a read, you partition into tokens uh, of five. And if you get all A's, now what you can do is you can access an entire row T bins, in this case, whatever your row length is. And you can check whether uh, this token that you have in this read exists in any of the parts of the genome that's represented uh, uh, by, the, by, the, by, the, by how many columns you have uh, in this bank. That's the idea. Now this can, you can very quickly do the filtering. If you see a read uh, that has a fragment that has a token ace, you can quickly figure out which bins match. If you see another read, uh, another part of the read that has some other token, or you can hear, you can very quickly see which parts match. And by accumulating these matching parts, you build confidence as to, oh, this fragment that you've just read may actually match this bin. And you create a, a bit mask based on that, and you ship it to the CPU such that the CPU can do more processing. So that's the idea over here. But the layout of these bit vectors in a bank enables filtering many bins in parallel. Of course, you need to design your algorithm. So we've changed the filtering algorithm completely to fit the structure of the uh, main memory over here. And if you read the paper, you will see that. And there's a customized logic for accumulation uh, and comparison per genome seg segment. It's very simple implementation once you actually transform your problem to, be, uh, to operate in parallel across many of the bins uh, by taking advantage of the parallelism in the uh, DRAM. And these are some results. This is the performance that we have. I don't think this is really optimized enough. I believe we can get up to 10x here. I don't know how, but I think uh, we, need, we can optimize it better. Uh, but we got basically a 1.8 to 3.7x uh, across real data sets. And these are real uh, genomes. And we actually, because we actually changed the filtering algorithm, you actually improve the false positive rate also, but we don't need to get into that uh, over here. Okay. So that's one example application. I think these sort of applications need to be examined, and there are many, many such applications. We're looking a lot into uh, databases right now, uh, especially uh, this hybrid transactional analytical databases. I think they're very interesting uh, to look into. But bioinformatics is also very, very interesting from my perspective. There's more. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we've written this paper. It's a book chapter that talks about the adoption challenges and also summarizes some of the works that we've done uh, in this area. If you're interested, you can take a look at this. Any questions? I see people are a bit tired. <laughs> okay, we're, we're at the end of the processing in memory. I can, I can actually go through more works, but I, I think it's better to start the latency part. Uh, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll have some fun with the uh, rest of the talk. <laughs> it's not going to be extremely technical. <laughs> Okay, so how do we enable the paradigm shift? I think this is a big paradigm shift. That's why it's really, you need to change a lot of things. Uh, this, is a, this is part of uh, what I motivate uh, people to study uh, computer architecture with. So I think today we're at a point, uh, a lot of things are changing in computer architecture. We can actually revolutionize the way computers are built if we understand hardware and software and change each accordingly. And I think we're at a point where we can actually really invent and enable new paradigms for computation, communication, and storage. Processing in memory is one example of this. And I see this. Uh, has anybody read this book by Thomas Kuhn? It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. It's actually a beautiful book. It's not an easy read if you read it the first time. The second time is easier. The third time is easier. You get stuff in your cache. Uh, but basically, uh, this was a very seminal book that uh, mm, 
put, that try to put structure into how big things happen in science. And he examines a lot of things in physics, chemistry, uh, astronomy, as to how uh, revolutions happen. And basically, uh, he says there are three stages. At some point, you have pre-paradigm science. There is no clear consensus in the field as to what the paradigm is. And after some point, you form a paradigm and you do normal science. There's a dominant theory that's used to explain and improve things, business as usual. Exceptions are considered anomalies. I think this is really interesting because I believe computer architecture was at that normal science stage in the 1990s. Basically, we had a dominant paradigm, and that dominant paradigm was superscalar out-of-order execution with heavy ILP, uh, instruction-level parallelism techniques, and everything else was on the fringes. Right? We improved that paradigm a lot, and all of the exceptions like, oh, what is this GPU over here? <laughs> What is this uh, high performance computing over here? Those are all anomalies, right? That's not the mainstream thing. The mainstream thing was superscalar, out of order, uh, high ILP processors. But that paradigm broke once it ran into some walls. I think complexity and power and energy were the biggest ones. Clearly, complexity more than anything else, uh, because you, without complexity, you didn't get more performance. Uh, and then uh, you, you go into this revolutionary science where you start examining underlying assumptions. And this is very clear, I think, because things are proliferating, right? We don't just have that paradigm anymore. People moved on, and there are a lot of other accelerators, GPUs, and people are really examining the underlying assumptions right now. It's not clear what the paradigm is at this point. Uh, certainly, there, there's a general purpose CPU space, but there are also many, many other things. I, can, I think I can do the same thing for memory over here. Business as usual in memory is improve capacity at all costs. Well, that's, that's like a misnomer maybe, but at all costs in the sense that you reduce cost with capacity, but it comes at a cost of many, many other things. So I think exceptions may be considered anomalies today, but that may change uh, in the future. So I think we're at a point where, I don't know where we are actually, where we may be in pre-paradigm science. We have no clear consensus as to what the dominant paradigm is. There's clearly not a dominant paradigm. And I think we need to definitely examine underlying assumptions. And maybe we'll, that will lead us to some several, one or more dominant theories to, uh, to, uh, to actually explain and improve things and get to a business as usual. Processing in memory could, would be a nice business as usual, for example, if we get to that. But th for that, we need to go through this rough period where we actually do the hard work to figure out what is the next paradigm, right? Or what are the next paradigms? So I like this book quite a bit. I actually used to, this is, this is the person who wrote the book. I actually used to give this book to people who did really well in my uh, assignments at CMU. Maybe I should start doing that again. I don't know if people ever read that book, but <laughs> I did my job by giving the book. <laughs> I don't know if people read the books, re read books anymore. But if you don't read them, you can find them on Kindle also. So that's, that's another way of reading books. OK. So let me. Yeah. Yeah, it's a cycle. He actually examines a lot of cycles in chemistry, uh, uh, physics, uh, astronomy, uh, like all of these theories. And he basically finds these patterns. And this was an extremely influential book. It got a lot of attacks, of course, because it was very influential. <laughs> so people actually criticized it quite a bit. But it, it basically formed one of the first theories of how revo uh, big scientific revolutions happen. And I take the liberty of applying it to, and what we're doing is not exactly science, right? We're doing engineering. Maybe plus science. So I, I take the liberty of applying it to engineering. <laughs> but is he glad that it's not progressing? Because it's the cycle. So it would be the no, no, it's progress, basically. You, you basically have some dominant theory, and that's, that enables you to improve things and make very fast progress. But at some point, you have enough evidence that that dominant theory breaks, so you, cre you create a new theory. Maybe, yeah. Maybe that's, that, that could be true, yes. It sounds like you want to read the book. I would definitely recommend it. <laughs> it's it's very, very much recommended. So it, it, talks, it deals with a lot of issues also, like why, why are these cycles delayed? For example, it goes into a lot of these issues with, for example, I, I complain about their use system, but he also talks about their use system. Why are, why are things rejected? Because there, there are certainly groups of people who want to keep the dominant theory as opposed to... Uh, uh, going to, going to something else, so it's 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 a 
uh, it's a, a philosophy of science book, but it's also a lot about psychology uh, uh, in, inside it. Okay, so let me t have a little bit more fun. <laughs> And then we're going to conclude this part, and hopefully we'll start the latency. So we've actually covered a lot uh, so far. Uh, so a third time over here, uh, uh, I'll, I'll put this. Maybe you don't really care about anything else other than speed over here. If you're speedy enough, maybe you don't need a lot of energy. I'll just make it up. Okay, I've already said this. So let me give you some concluding remarks. Uh, we're talking about different fields right now. But there is a famous architect that said this. Architecture should be based upon principle and not upon, not upon precedent. Precedent means what comes before, right? Does anybody know who this architect is? Who? No, not me, not me. <laughs> I'm not a famous architect. This architect is very famous. Is a computer architect or? What do you think? <laughs> no, <laughs> somebody said no. Yeah, he is not a computer architect. <laughs> Yeah, this is Frank Lloyd Wright. He did not build this <laughs> because he didn't build, uh, believe in uh, precedence. So if he be believed in the precedent, then he would have built something like this, which is not bad, right? Instead, he formed a new paradigm based on his principles. So this is, you, many of you may know it. Does anybody know what this is? Okay. Have you ever been to Pittsburgh? No, okay. Now there's a reason for you to go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> If there's no other reason, you should go there just for this. And I, I think this may be actually one of the biggest reasons to go to Pittsburgh. This is close to Pittsburgh. It's not in Pittsburgh. It's about one and a half hours away. This is called Falling Water. It's basically a house uh, that's built uh, in his uh, paradigm on top of a waterfall. This waterfall existed before the house. And I mean, there's a lot to examine here, but basically he modeled the house based on the shape of the waterfall. And it's very nice. Uh, and this is actually taught in Architecture 101 uh, books. Uh, uh, and this is the principle that this person followed. Uh, yeah, you can see that. And this is the most famous things in, things in Pittsburgh, I think. OK, uh, now that I'm in Zurich, I use some other examples. <laughs> so this is something that looks OK to me. It's a boring train, sta train station, basically. It's a precedent-based design. Actually, all of the train stations look like this in Switzerland. It works. It's functional. Not so bad, but it's nothing like this. So I just contradicted myself because it's another train station in Switzerland. <laughs> it's in Zurich. Does anybody know what this is? It's less famous than falling water, clearly. This is Stadelhofen in Zurich, but uh, this was also designed by a very famous architect who had very hard-headed principles in his mind. And you can see that this resembles something more natural as well, right? It's like a bird. And this is another building designed by the same architect. This is in Lisbon. And this is the blueprint. It's more zoomorphic, as you can see. Whatever these things are, are holding uh, the station. This is in Sevilla, the same architect. It's like a pigeon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's Calatrava. And this is also by the same architect. You may know this one. Yeah, this is in New York. This is Oculus. This is another train station or top of a train station. And this was very expensive. All of these architects are very expensive. So PIM is very expensive also. <laughs> no question about that. And this was $4 billion. And it was very controversial. And it's not the full thing, actually. People criticize it by saying, oh, it was supposed to be like a bird, and it turned out to be a dinosaur. <laughs> and that's true, maybe. But it's beautiful. Once you get to it, you forget about the $4 billion. Now that it's there, you can use it. <laughs> I think that's very true for the paradigm shifts also. PIM right now may look like it's extremely expensive. Yes, but once it's there, it's going to be very, very usable. You know we have a Calatrava train still here in Lisbon. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. OK. <laughs> because it passed here. It's a statue, it's not a building. I see. It's not a building. So you didn't construct anything. <laughs> Is called Trava statue in Jerusalem? <laughs> oh, I see. I'm curious. Okay. And this is him. See, he's actually an ETH alumnus in civil engineering. He graduated from ETH. That's why Bahnhof Stahlhofen was his first big assignment in Zurich. 
Uh, and I mean, he has another principle, like similar to the other uh, architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, who had the principle of organic architecture. The structures should be a little be uh, in harmony with the things around them, the nature around them. This person had this zoomorphic uh, architecture principle, and there are many, many other things, as you can see over here. And you can recognize them actually once you once you get used to it, you understand. So I think I'll ask the question: Why am I telling you all this? First of all, expensive stuff is important, no question about that. Once it's enabled, it's not expensive anymore. But getting to that stage will be expensive, no question. Uh, do we have the overarching principle for computing? I don't believe so. Maybe I should say overarching principles for computing because there may be multiple principles. Today we're designing systems that I believe are extremely far away from principle designs. Well, there is a principle, and I think the principle can be best summarized in terms of the context of what we're doing right now is processor centricity. I'm not sure if that processor centricity is a principle that is a good principle that can be followed. I'm not sure if this thing works in that way. I'm not suggesting that we have to imitate this thing because this also has a lot of downsides potentially. But it's not clear if that processor centricity is a principle that's anywhere else. I'm not sure what, how to find the principles of computing. Yes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe it's gone, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so maybe a better principle is heterogeneity as opposed to one size fits all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It comes at a cost, I think. No question about that. Okay. So basically, I, I believe we need to discover those principles somehow. We, but I think we're doing something wrong for sure. Uh, basically, we need to design more principled system architectures to solve the memory problem. Uh, we're, we're doing something wrong because we're, our, our designs are very imbalanced today. Uh, so we're vi violating that balanced design principle. Uh, uh, maybe we need to be more balanced. If we enable computation in many different places, we can potentially be more balanced. And of course, high performance and energy efficient. I believe data centricity is uh, required for that. If we enable computation capability inside and close to memory, we can get there, potentially. And I believe this can lead to orders of magnitude improvements. I've given you some examples. There were orders of magnitude over there, but I think there is more possible. This can enable new applications and computing platforms. Who knows, right? We don't know yet. And maybe enable a better understanding of nature also. And who knows what else? But it's not going to be easy. <laughs> But I think the future is bright, uh, regardless of the challenges and underlying technology and overlying problems. Uh, we can enable things, but we need to think across the stack and design enabling systems. Now, maybe this is a smaller paradigm shift, but uh, we've done it before. We've talked about flash memory. And I think flash memory, like 30 years ago or so, was a very doubtful technology. Right? I know people who were working on algorithms for flash memory, like garbage collection for flash memory, which is really fundamental to a lot of things that we do in flash memory today. And they all, they all had pushback, basically. They, were right, they quit working on flash memory because they wrote proposals to NSF at the time. They got rejected and said, who cares about this technology? And you're talking about garbage collection. <laughs> I think we, we always have these people who will push back right, and say, because they don't believe in something or whatever. They're, they're too hard-headed in the precedent. But I think it's important to be hard-headed in the principles as well. Uh, so. It was a very doubtful emerging technology for at least two decades, but now we have lots of infrastructure to enable it, right? It's actually a technology that doesn't work. Um, a lot of the bits in flash memory don't work if you don't do something about them. You really need to build the infrastructure to make it work. I see processing in memory as a similar example, maybe in a broader scale. And the benefits may be even higher than flash memory. And this is where I'll, I'll end over here and take more questions. But this was the fun part. Yes. Yes. Memory centric. Yes. Okay.
Exactly. So I agree with you that I think memory centric is a subset of data centric. Data centric can have many, many approaches. I agree with that. No question. That's why I have it in parentheses. I don't want to advocate just memory centric because I think it's very limiting. But data centric, so you could also have be data centric while moving the data in the interconnect, right? Any other questions? We can take questions or we can start the latency part. Unless I have a lecture 3A. I don't. What do people think? <laughs> let's start. OK. Who agrees with that? Let's start or? OK, let's start the latency part then. So let me see. We have about 30 minutes. That's, that's good. I don't think we'll cover everything. OK. This is it, if it opens. OK. So I think this is another example of the fact that we're ignoring some things in memory. The fact that we haven't examined many approaches to low latency memory today, it's very sad from my perspective. Because memory latency, we've, we've examined many approaches to tolerate memory latency, but maybe not enough approaches to reducing the latency at where it resides. OK, so we're going to focus on this one now. And I've already done this to you, so I'm not going to, I'm going to spare you uh, from that. So how, how do we build fundamentally low latency architectures? Uh, we've already done that, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, OK, so the memory latency problem. High memory latency is a significant limiter of system performance and energy efficiency. I think nobody can dispute that today. It's becoming increasingly so with higher memory contention in multi-core and heterogeneous architectures. Basically, the longer latencies you have are being exacerbated because of the contention. It's exacerbating the bandwidth need also. It's exacerbating the quality of service problem. So if you start with small memory latencies, contention will not also happen or happen very little. And it also increases processor design complexity due to the mechanisms incorporated uh, to tolerate memory latency. And there are many of these mechanisms. And actually, I've covered a lot of them during my PhD. This is a direct copy and paste from my dissertation slides. Uh, I, call, I added the retrospective over there. <laughs> These are conventional latency tolerance techniques. And we've been developing them and making them better and better and better and better. Caching, actually, this is wrong, as I said earlier, initially by uh, uh, Bloom, Cohen, and Porter uh, in 1962. It's widely used. But it's not as effective. But we've embellished caches for a long time, right? Prefetching, and it works nicely. Uh, and we've embellished prefetches a lot. Multi-threading, it's a latency tolerance technique. It was developed to be that way. Uh, and we've embellished it a lot. And we have massive amounts of multi-threading in GPUs today. Out of order execution, clearly we've, that was the paradigm for a long time, right? We've embellished a lot. And in my PhD thesis, I motivated this by out of order execution, we want to tolerate cache misses in a much more efficient way. But if you look at all of these techniques that we've been developing for more than 50 years, none of them really fundamentally reduce the latency. They're very processor centric, again, basically. They're there to tolerate the latency somehow. Caching, yes, it reduces the latency from the processor's perspective, but it doesn't really reduce the latency of where the data really comes from, right? The access latency, you amortize it over time. Prefetching, same. It's there to tolerate the latency. It reduces the latency from the processor's perspective. Multi-threading definitely doesn't they reduce the latency. And out of order execution, again, doesn't reduce the latency. They are all latency tolerance techniques. Uh, so we want to actually fundamentally reduce latency. So there are two major sources of latency inefficiency. First of all, modern DRAM is not designed for low latency. It's designed for maximal capacity. Main focus is cost per bit. So we're going to try to deconstruct that a little bit. Can we get rid of, not fully get rid of it, but can we actually make room for design for low latency while not significantly reducing the capacity? That's going to be one of the goals. 
And modern DRAM latency is determined by worst case conditions and worst case devices. Can we actually relax that? Basically, we're really determining the latency based on worst case. Much of memory latency is unnecessary if you look at the common case. And we're going to try to look at that common case. And our goal is to essentially reduce the memory latency at the source of the problem as opposed to trying to patch it with caching, prefetching, multi-threading, or out-of-order execution, all of which increase complexity. And I believe actually reducing latency is good for a lot of things in the system. I'll show you some results showing that reducing latency actually reduces the energy consumption as well. So then the key question is what causes the long memory latency? So let's go into uh, that problem. So I'm going to give you two reasons, and we're going to cover uh, two reasons uh, to begin with. One is the design of the DRAM. Again, our focus is on DRAM, uh, since it's a dominant technology, uh, and it will probably dominate for some time uh, unless something comes in. Uh, basically, the design of the micro DRAM microarchitecture is there to maximize capacity per area, not to minimize latency. Right? And the second is this one-size-fits-all approach to everything that we had in uh, and that's true for latency specification also. We use the same latency parameters regardless of whatever we are dealing with, whatever temperature, DRAM chip, parts of a DRAM chip, supply voltage levels, and application data. So we're going to try to re relax these. So let's look at the first reason over here. I'm going to introduce the idea of tiered latency DRAM. So let's look at uh, the latency components in a DRAM chip. You already know this structure. You have subarrays, and you have I.O. access latency in DRAM. And DRAM latency is a subarray latency plus I.O. latency. And it turns out this is the dominant part because you can actually play a lot of tricks over here like prefetching to overlap the uh, I.O. access latency, whereas it's very difficult to overlap the subarray access latency unless you do subarray level parallelism. Uh, but that's a latency tolerance technique. That's not a latency reduction technique. So why is the subarray so slow? Uh, okay, I don't know what happened here. Oops. Okay. Basically, this is the two-dimensional two structure. You have a cell, and cell looks like this. And you need a large sense amplifier. As I said earlier, the size of the sense amplifier needs to be, uh, is today, more than 100 times the size of a cell uh, because it needs to sense things well. As a result of this, what DI manufacturers do is to have long bit lines. If you have long bit lines and string together many cells to be connected to the same sense amplifiers, you amortize the sense amplifier cost. This leads to a small area. You basically use one sense amplifier to sense any one of the 512 cells over here. And even 512 is long. Remember, we broke the bank abstraction into subarray. Bank was 32,000 cells. OK, we said that's too long latency. Uh, so let's break it into 512 and have local sensing structures, but even this is too long. So large bit line capacitance because of the 512 cells or 1,024 cells leads to high latency and, and also high power. So can we actually reduce this? So there's a very fundamental trade-off between area and latency, and it's very hard to break this trade-off. So if you have long bit lines, you can get rid of them. You can make them shorter bit lines, make your subarrays even smaller, and have more sensing structures. You get faster. But clearly, the trade-off is you have more area right now. Smaller is over here. So we have this trade-off between area and latency. How do we break that trade-off? Let's take a look at what that trade-off looks like first. So this is uh, latency on the x-axis, and this is normalized DRAM area on the y-axis. Today, uh, basically, this is cheaper as you go down, and this is faster as you go down. Ideal ideally, you would like to be somewhere here, right? Zero and zero. Uh, but the curve looks like this, based on the selection that you have in terms of the length of the bit line. So commodity DRAM makes the choice of 512 or so cells per bit line. And as a result, it's high latency, but it's low cost. Well, this is not exactly cost, by the way. Uh, cost doesn't necessarily correlate linearly with the normalized DRAM area. But we can talk about that. It also uh, correlates with your manufacturing capacity. So there is some DRAM that's out there that makes a trade-off over here. I call this the fancy DRAM. They have short bit lines. A reduced latency DRAM or fast cycling DRAM is like this. And some people pay an arm and a leg to the DRAM manufacturers for it, especially if they want really fast memory access, like very high bandwidth routers, for example, that require low latency. Uh, so these are very expensive. So the key question is, can we somehow get here? 
And if I told you that I have a solution to get here, you, would, you should kick me out of the room because I cannot break that fundamental trade-off. <laughs> but we'll try to exploit some other principle to at least enable, best, uh, enable the use of best, best of both worlds. Let's see. So we'd like to approximate the best of both worlds. Uh, so we'll start with this long bit line architecture. The upside is small area, the downside is high latency. Short bit line, the upside is low latency, the downside is large area. And whenever you see something like this, it's a good idea to think about heterogeneity. I think that's a very fundamental principle. So the proposal is to start with the short bit line. Uh, we want the small area, but we don't want the high latency, at least for some parts. So the idea is to segment the bit line, basically. So if you actually create a region in this long bit line architecture that can be accessed very quickly, you may actually use that region for actually uh, fast accesses. So this requires some isolation inside the bit lines. And for this, we add isolation transistors. The idea is you have these isolation transistors that segment the bit line. And if you enable them, you get to access this part. If you disable them, you get to access this part only. And, but you can access it very quickly because these, are, these look like these short bit lines. You have low capacitance. That's the idea. That's, that's why this is called the tiered latency DRAM. And you have two portions. You have small area using long bit lines. And you get low latency in this portion. And there is, of course, an area overhead. Nothing comes for free. The area overhead comes from the isolation transistor that you have over here. OK, so what's the benefit? This is really 6%, even though this, uh, is not uh, this bar is wrong. It should be down 44 here. Yes? Yeah, the memory controller. I'm going to talk about the control a little bit. But let's take a look at the basic uh, benefits of this. So I think this is if you have 32 cells, 32 rows in the near segment. So the, the near segment is near to the sense amplifiers. The far segment is the far part. If you have 32 cells, 32 rows over here and 480 rows over here. And commodity DRAM has 512 rows. This is a row cycling latency. So near segment access latency can be reduced by 56%. The trade-off is a bit unfortunate. Now your far segment latency increases because when you enable the isolation transistors, they have additional resistance. And that leads to a longer latency for the far segment. So I'm not going to give you a perfect solution. And if you have a perfect solution, that would be great. OK, so, so in this case, this is 32 and this is 480. And we have some results in the paper. Maybe I'll cover them uh, if we get to that uh, as to how that trade-off changes. Uh, so this is the power consumption. So if you're only accessing the near segment, that's good because you reduce the power by 51%. But if you're accessing the far segment, now your power consumption increases compared to the commodity DRAM. So if you have a substrate like this, you would like to manage it such that you access the near segment as much as possible. And the DRAM area overhead is actually high. Manufacturers don't like the sort of area overheads, but maybe they should change their mindset a little bit also. Uh, it's not as bad uh, as uh, the reduced latency DRAM, for example. OK, so this is the trade-off, basically. We want it to be here. Near segment gets us here, but the far segment puts us back. Now we need to manage this memory. Uh, so it's a substrate that can be leveraged by the hardware and or the software. There are many potential uses. We covered some of them in this paper. Uh, one of them could be use the near segment as hardware managed inclusive cache. This means that if it's an inclusive cache, you're reducing the capacity of your memory because part of it is your cache. You could manage it as an exclusive cache. Now you don't reduce the capacity, but you need to do some swapping whenever you move something from the far segment to the near segment. So that has other implications. And this has implications on the memory controller, of course, in terms of what you need to store in the memory controller. Or you could actually manage by the software, the operating system maps some frequently used pages to uh, the near segment. We haven't examined these comprehensively. I think there's a lot more to do over here. One thing that we know that doesn't work in existing mapping mechanism is this. You simply replace DRAM with TLDRAM with these characteristics that I showed you. It doesn't buy you anything. Why? Because these frequently accessed pages don't magically end up in the near segment. If they did, that would be great. But they don't. OK, so let's take a look at some of these over here. 
Uh, I'll look at especially this one, inclusive cache, and the paper covers all of these. It, al it also talks about the intricacies of how to manage the cache. Uh, so if you think about near segment as a hardware man managed cache, essentially your memory is divided into this. You have the far segment, near segment, and sense amplifiers, right? And far segment is your real main memory. Near segment is a cache to that main memory. So there are two challenges. How do you efficiently migrate a row between segments? That's the first challenge. But we already know how to do that, I think, with row clone. That's the idea. Uh, and how do you efficiently manage the cache? Uh, let's look at this first challenge over here. I think we already know. Migrate the source row into the destination row. This is the far segment. This is the isolation transistor. This is the near segment. If you want to access something over here, and if you decide to move it over here, you want to do the copy. How do you do that? Uh, well, naive way is going through the memory controller, but that's terrible. You don't want to do that. Uh, so uh, the way is really source and destination cell share the bit lines. So you basically activate this one and activate this one uh, through the shared bit lines. Activate the source row, which brings the data into the uh, row buffer, and then activation, activate the destination. So it's basically row clone employed across the segments. And okay. So the second challenge is how do you efficiently manage the cache? And I'm not going to go through all of the cache management literature, but we've done the simplest thing, which is an LRU cache, which is really not the best way of using substrate. But even that improves performance. So this is across, I think, I believe 80 workloads or so. And there's no special management that we employ. Whenever we touch uh, a row uh, in the far segment, we bring it into the near segment. And even if you do that, you get reasonably high benefits, more than 10%. And if you actually do more intelligent management mechanisms, I believe you get more. Uh, and the power consumption, again, with simple cache management mechanisms, this is memory power, uh, is also significant. You get, a, you get about 20% savings. So that's the idea. So this is uh, what you asked, varying the near segment length. This is near segment length. It could be one row. It could be 256 rows. And the, uh, 512 minus this is the length of the far segment. And this is the performance improvement curve that we get. So you get larger cache capacity over here, but you get higher cache access latency also. Higher uh, uh, near segment access latency. So actually, even a segment length of one buys you a lot of performance, but of course it's not the highest that you can get. 32 is what we found out to be the best. So why is one good? Actually, this. Uh, if, the, the reason that you get benefit from this is you get bank conflicts, right? If you, if you actually have a lot of bank conflicts, having one more that has short latency reduces the latency of your bank conflicts. Yes? I see, yeah. Yeah, I haven't thought about that actually. That sounds interesting. But I'm Oh, the question is basically in a motherboard, if you have multiple DIMMs, uh, you uh, the frequency needs to be reduced and as a result your latency increases. But if you have a single DIMM, your frequency is high. So, uh, the proposal is at the motherboard level employ maybe some similar solution. Let's say have isolation transistors between the connections to the DIMM, and if you're accessing this DIMM, you just cut the connections to the other DIMM. I mean, I haven't thought about the implications of that. At the motherboard level, the control is a little bit worse, I think. I think that's the big downside, perhaps. Uh, I don't know how fine-grained control you can have at low latency at that level. And there are also other electrical characteristics that I haven't considered. Yeah, yeah. And normally you should, right? Exactly, it's a coarser grain version of this maybe, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 
I mean, that, I think that's interesting. And also, it depends on how fast you can change the clock frequency, right? Probably. I haven't thought about it. I think that, that may be interesting to pursue. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I agree with you. I think that's a very good point. Basically, we don't take the capacity overhead into account uh, over here because all of our workloads happen to fit in the memory. But yeah, this may be actually a better number to choose. But I think there needs to be more exploration here because my, my feeling is you don't want an LRU cache over there. And people have shown that LRU is a terrible algorithm once you get farther from the processor like L2 caches, L3 caches, you need some other management mechanisms. So uh, maybe if you have a, so the, the problem is one, with one is, yes, you get 8%, but I'm not sure how that will behave if you have a lot of contention. Four. Four. Oh, four, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, four is better. Okay, four. sure. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Four is one percent. Yeah, that's right, it's very, it's very close to 32, yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, so that could be true actually. I mean, we haven't considered that, uh, but you gotta be very careful of course once you're reading out uh, into the, uh, it will save you the latency. But uh, I think the problem I see over there is you may not need everything you read out into the uh, memory controller because you may actually be touching only a little part of the row and you may actually need only two rows if you read everything out into the memory controller, then you may have overwhelmed uh, the latency to begin with. Yeah, I think that's, that's the downside of that little connection <laughs> between memory and the memory controller. If you're reusing the entire row, I agree. I think that, that would benefit. But I'm not sure if you're using, a lot of our results suggest that you're using only a little part of the row and then you have bank conflicts uh, in, in some little parts. Okay, okay. Yeah, and that's the idea basically. This was one of the first papers that we've written after subarray level parallelism. Uh, so 3% area overhead, nobody likes it. <laughs> I, I, but I believe, I mean personally, I think uh, people should explore these mechanisms that have high area overhead that could potentially lower latency because otherwise there's no progress, right? I think there's a huge pushback from people who don't want progress maybe uh, saying that, oh, DRAM manufacturers will never do it, right? Let's see, I think, let's explore the ideas. Maybe we'll get to those mechanisms that have really low overhead. But without exploring it, by cutting research early, it's, it's very difficult to get to that point. So I think Structure of Scientific Revolution is a really good book to read. <laughs> because it explains the current phenomenon of these, the mindset of people also, right? There's a status quo, business as usual, and people take it really as how science should be, but that's really not true. Uh, science should be much broader than that. You, sh you should really take these leap leaps and say, okay, if we actually change the trade-off significantly, this is what we could potentially enable. And if you never explore that space, you'll never get there anyway. Okay, so <laughs> I really like this work, but I'm sure there will be some people will say, oh, 3% is too much, this is useless. Okay, so let's, let me finish this one also. This will, this will probably take six minutes or so. Uh, I promised this one uh, to you earlier. Basically, the problem with row clone, so you can see that there are similarities in this. You need row clone to make this work. And the problem with row clone is this inter subray movement. And uh, we wanted to tackle that problem. And it turns out if you actually rethink the internals of the DRM architecture and how things are connected with each other, you can, you can, you can tackle that problem and you can also do more. Uh, so our motivation was this to begin with, uh, data, about data moment to the key operation. And as you know by now that if you do it through the memory channel, it's a slow process. And I could animate this and we, we would be waiting. That's essentially what we're doing in systems today. So we're waiting basically. Uh, 
uh, what, what do you mean? In, in, in this case or in what, in the tiered latency DM? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, the memory controller knows uh, no, no, exactly no. which bank because of the address. No, no, that's what I'm not sure. So if you take an address, a physical address, uh, that is mapped to a particular location, a particular rank, uh, like we've discussed earlier, particular rank, particular DIM, particular rank, particular bank. The memory controller knows all of that. Well, then you need to, uh, it gets configured. Yes, it should know, right? <laughs> okay, then I don't know. <laughs> well, the memory controller controls at the bank level, right? It has to manage the bank. So it has to know uh, what, how many banks you have and what addresses you use. Subway is no, no. Subway is no. I, uh, yeah, you don't go into that level. But bank level, yeah, you need to know at least uh, up to the bank level. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Because we can take questions and not cover this also. <laughs> okay. Yeah, in this case, yeah. Uh, but here you do actually a copy, just like we discussed earlier. So moving data inside the app. Uh, basically, these are banks, these are subarrays now. Uh, so you have 512 rows in each subarray, and you have an internal data bus. Uh, uh, so if you want to transfer from one subarray to another subarray, you need to go through some other bank using that internal data bus. So there's low connectivity in DRAM, and that's the fundamental bottleneck for bulk data movement if you want to move between two subarrays. So our goal was to provide a substrate to enable wide connectivity between subarrays. So connect these subarrays with something wide. And the idea is very simple. We're going to make use of these isolation transistors again to enable fast bulk data movement. You have a wide data path via isolation transistors. It's relatively small DRAM chip area. There have been some other works that have shown that it's 0.8%, but it's very hard to get an exact number over here. The idea is very simple. As opposed to having these isolation transistors to segment the bit lines, we use more isolation transistors to connect the subarrays, to connect different bit lines basically, because these bit lines are not connected today. And it turns out this enables not just movement from one subway to another, but other applications. One is movement from one subway to another. Before we spent this much time, now we reduce that latency by almost 10x and energy significantly. This could enable in DRAM caching. Basically, you could use a small subway as a fast cache. So one subway can be smaller, it can have 32, uh, rows, for example, another subarray may have 1,024 rows. You can have heterogeneity, and you can use this as an internal cache to this other subarray, and you can move the data very quickly between the subarrays, and we looked at that also. And this could also enable fast pre-charge, because now uh, whenever you're pre-charging an array, you're able to use the pre-charge structures on both sides of the subarray, and that, could, that increases, reduces your pre-charge latency significantly too. So it's good to have more connectivity, basically. And we introduced this new DRAM command to use what we call LISA, low-cost interlink subarrays, row buffer movement. Move a row of data to an activated row buffer to a pre-charged one. So let's take a look at this command. So you basically have the subarray uh, that's activated, and you have this one pre-charged. Uh, and basically, uh, you have this row buffer movement command that's want, uh, that, that wants to move whatever is here into this next subarray. How do you do that? You basically turn on the isolation transistors with this command. And because of chart sharing, what happens is essentially these sense amplifiers sense the charge and amplify the charge, and they basically copy whatever is here into themselves. That's the idea over here. Now, uh, this, this row that was sensed over here is also in, this, in these sense amplifiers, so you can copy it anywhere here, or you can copy it into the next subarray. Or you can copy it in the next subarray, in the next subarray, dot, dot, dot. That's right, but it's restricted to uh, the, the length of the spit line. Exactly. So that's, that's exactly why we don't do it across many, many subarrays. If you do it between two subarrays, that's good. But if you do it across many subarrays, that's, yeah, 
that's problematic. Okay, so we restrict that, uh, we use basically, actually we do it for two subarrays. Uh, if you want to move data across more than three subarrays, then uh, you use multiple RBMs. Okay, basically we can do this, but if you want to go beyond, you need to use multiple robot for movement. And we validate it with SPICE using worst case cells, and we actually put a lot of guard band as well. So basically, you can, you can move data internally with 500 gigabytes per second. It's 26 times the bandwidth of a DDR4-2400 channel, uh, assuming you do four kilobyte data in eight nanoseconds. I think you can do better, actually. The 60% guard band is very high. And that's the area overhead. Okay, so let's take a look at these applications very quickly, and then we'll be done. Basically, we want to efficiently copy a row across subarrays. So we use this RBM robot for movement to form a new command sequence. You activate the source row, which brings data over here. You do the robot for movement, and then you activate the destination row. That's how we accomplish the data movement. And this uh, reduces row copy latency by 9x and DRAM energy by 48x. So it's almost like intra-subarray intra movement, except you're going uh, one subarray. But this gives you a lot of flexibility. So the next idea is variable latency DRAM. Uh, so you have the long bit line, short bit line, we've already seen this. Uh, the problem is short bit line architecture has high overhead. So the key idea is you have a heterogeneous DRAM design. So you have some fast subarrays and some slow subarrays. The problem is, actually this was proposed before, but it was, there, there was no way of connecting quickly moving data from here to here so that you can have an efficient cache. And enabling these isolation transistors, interlinking these subarrays enables uh, you to cache the data very fast. You don't want to go through some other structure to actually uh, move a row from this subarray to uh, that fast subarray. And actually the previous work that proposed this idea uh, assumed that you don't do this dynamically, but assume that some data gets mapped uh, based on profiling to this fast subarray and some data gets mapped to the slow subarray through profiling and they don't move. Okay, so this actually uh, reduces the hot data access latency significantly with relatively small overhead. And the last one is linked precharge. The precharge time is limited by the strength of a single precharge unit. So in conventional DRAM, you have a single precharge unit for a given subarray. But if you actually interconnect the subarrays, you can use the precharge unit of both subarrays to precharge a single subarray. And that's the idea. You drive on both sides. And as a result, precharge latency reduces by 2.6x even with 43% guard band. So I think this is really interesting. I believe there is more work to be done in this area. Interconnection inside the DRAM is something that needs to be examined. And also this is true for uh, new memory technologies as well. Okay, now that we're out of time, this is a good place to be out of time uh, because we're going to start with the second uh, reason tomorrow. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow morning.